Okay, I'm gonna call us back. Um, it sounds like there was really rich conversation. And uh, I invite you, there's plenty of food, so I invite you after five o'clock, please just fill up your plates and keep talking, okay? Um, who's, you know, we've got the room, so just uh, please keep talking as long as you'd like. As an example of our global reach, while this presentation was going on, and while Dr. Moore was giving his response, we got a email from a student in Guam, who is currently in Guam, telling us about how this is impacting her own research. So this is pretty exciting. Um, what we'd like to do is to now open this up to a kind of a group conversation. If you have questions for Dr. Ruiz or two uh, responders, please, they are happy to respond. But we'd like to um, open it up for any of you at tables, part of the reason why I suggested you might pick a table leader is to have that person maybe report back. Is there something that you would really like to share that would be a blessing to the group? Um, is there a question that emerged out of your conversation that you'd like to open up? This is not necessarily the case that our, our three official participants will be the only ones uh, talking, but we'd like to just open it up. And I see that my dear friend Andy, who is so good about starting things off, has not disappointed. So Andy, take it away. Thank you so much for the presentation, Dr. Ruiz, and, and uh, respondents, Dr. Moore, and, and Reverend uh, Davis. My, my question comes to, to uh, the comments made about our own mission statement here at Trinity Evangelical Divinity S School. And, uh, and the emphasis, as Dr. Ruiz was reading this statement, was on the phrase, in the world. And uh, Dr. Moore brought that up also. And I was just wondering, uh, as we were talking at our table, what is meant by in the world? Because I could read that and think, yeah, Jesus said we're in the world, but not of the world. That's just talking about where I live right now, not, he not heaven, but here in this local place. Or it could mean what we're talking about here in this being globally engaged, thinking interconnective, inter international, inter and, and on the list can go. And so I was wondering what is meant when Trinity puts that on their mission statement in the world. Okay. I wonder if Dr. Moore might be first wanting to respond to that, or maybe not. Um, if one of our three. You know, Andy, that's a, that's a great question. And one of the things that we look for at ATS is every time we do a, a revisit, we ask them, what's, what's your regular plan for reexamining your mission statement? And I think, you know, I'm sure that administrators here have a simple answer for that, but I'll just give them an out and say, we're going to be re-examining our mission statement just so that we can clarify that. Of course, unless the president has a direct answer for you. <laughs> okay, is there anyone else, uh, Dr. Luis or actually Reverend Dr. Davis, would you like to? Um... Okay. <laughs> Do you wanna? So, so can I parlay, can I try to attempt an answer to that and then parlay that into a question on the behalf of the table? Okay. So, okay, great. Uh, well, hey, thank you gentlemen for just tremendous talks, uh, delivery, plus also responses. So the way I've always interpreted Andy in the world is precisely the way Dr. Rue has interpreted um, and uh, as, as well as uh, Dr. Moore, and that is that it refers primarily to the the world as, as ethnic categories. Now, this part leads into my other question, and that is when we use the term global, are we talking about predominantly geog geographical categories or ethnic categories? And how has the advent of globalization changed the, the, the whole way that we think about this? Yep. Yeah, that's actually an excellent question. It's one that I was even thinking about as well, is that um, I guess I would say permeable boundaries. Um, there's just so much overlap and really, as Dr. Moore said about his neighborhood, I think that's representative of many neighborhoods, um, that you know, the, the old idea of going over there is often just crossing the street, which I think is really the reality for many people who are living here. Dr. Weiss, did you want to add anything to this 
discussion. You don't have to, but I don't want to leave you out of it. You, you've got the mic. Oh. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Well, um, this is part of the challenge, right? And part of what we're, what I'm trying to do, and what others, and what we're learning, is that global is not just geographical reach. Uh, it's cultural, it's ethnic, it's uh, gender. It, it's, it's a whole, it's world in terms of of meaning, and signification, and which means then once you start talking about meaning, then you're talking a community. And so then what Jim, for example, talks about when you just cross the street, well, that is also part of the community where the conversation about what does this world open up? What is that world? So global for me is about world, not, I'm used, I try to use the world rather than global because global has too many imperial uh, connotations and geostrategic uh, things, but world, you know, is a little bit different. So world is, is this whole um, experience of signification and meaning, for me, anyway. Wonderful. Is there someone, oh yes. Thank you for your very thoughtful presentations. I'm, I'm wondering about anticipating the formal and non-formal theme of ISET in a couple, week, a couple weeks in Turkey. And could you just, any, any of the three of you, could you give us some thoughts about what does non-formal have to do with formal theological education, and maybe even vice versa? I mean, a whole there's going to be a whole week's worth of the world coming together in Turkey and talking about that. But I just wonder if you can anticipate a little bit of that conversation for us while we're here today. It's a small question. It, it's probably open to any of the three musketeers. I think. <laughs> You know, there's one thing about being a three musketeer when you're the youngest. <laughs> it just doesn't pan out. You end up carrying all these cashews back into the country. There's a story with that, too. You'll have to ask, ask him or Perry Downs. What was the question? Oh, informal, <laughs> non-formal. I was trying to get off the subject. You know, one, I was telling uh, Lester this uh, just a couple hours ago. One of the interesting things in the last ISET meeting was I was in the discussion on um, sort of what are the criteria for quality assurance, and the question was about what are the criteria for quality assurance in non-formal education? And so they were listing these things, and every one of the 12 things they listed are also objectives for us in formal theological education. And I was just like, come on, you guys, you can do better than that. So, so I mean, I think, I think that's a great question, is what really is non-formal education? And is it, can our concepts of what, edu, you know, let's drop the formal, non-formal, informal sort of categories, and what is education? And I mean, you know, historically, we'd argue that part of it was apprenticeship. I mean, especially, you know, preparation for the church. So is that formal education or non-formal education? Yes. <laughs> He's messing my answer up. <laughs> so Dr. Tianu will finish the, my thoughts. Well, I don't know about finishing your thoughts, um, although I, I will try. I, I think that um, um, when it comes to theological education, we have to think carefully about what adjectives we use. So uh, formal theological education, what does it actually mean uh, in terms of uh, do you have to have a place? Uh, do you have to have, what, what does it mean? What does non-formal mean? And who does non-formal mean no teachers? Or would you have teachers? As long as you have education, by definition, at least in my, in my mind, all education has some aspect of formal that goes with it. All education. It's intentionality, that's what the formal part is for me. So beginning at, in our homes, 
um, anytime as in the, in the biblical kind of uh, statement, uh, you have to teach your children when you sit down, when you lie down, when you walk with them, this is all formal. Or the only time there's, there's no formal part is when you are silent. So I would say, let's, be, um, let's try to choose vocabulary that helps us. Um, so I would say, theological education in general uh, is what we need to attend to. And yes, I understand why we use non-formal and formal, uh, but I try to resist that. I'm uh, displaying my age now. There was a time when uh, there was theological education by extension. Way back in the 60s. Um, and um, um, this was supposed to be non-formal theological education. But then people began to ask, will I be able to be a pastor if I do theological education by extension? And churches had to scramble, by churches I mean denominations, had to scramble to decide whether or not what people got in TEE was enough to become a pastor. So back to square one then, <laughs> uh, with, with this uh, a, a TEE or the non, uh, or uh, those of us who are here in a place that is Trinity is not, is not TEE. And uh, so I think that uh, uh, that's what I would suggest we do. We try to think harder. And uh, I know you're going to be in Izmir. And um, if I'm in any venue, you probably will not be surprised that this will be the, the question I'll be pushing for all of us. Let's think, that's my final statement. Jim Moore and I, uh, compadres in, uh, for 13 years, uh, we, let's think outside of the box. Let's refuse the vocabulary that we so easily use uh, when it does not really help us. Uh, may I tell a story, <clears throat> um, two, uh, two stories, uh, maybe unrelated, but actually there's some logic to it. So I was once asked, not in the US context, but I was once asked to review uh, a journal uh, article about whether online education was valid education. And the argument was being made philosophically, actually, that it is not education because, one, there's no classroom. How can there be a classroom when the, if you're doing by Zoom, for example, the person is not sitting in, in, a, in, a, in a classroom, and then there's a baby that is uh, being taken care of, or the mailman comes, or, you know, that, that you see the, you know, so I, and I was asked uh, as a quote-unquote scholar to review this and say this is worth publishing, and I, well, you can guess what I said. Uh, <laughs> I said, well, maybe the person who's writing this needs to think a little more about formal and non-formal education. So it's a, that, that, those categorizations are a little bit problematic uh, for me. Um, you have, an, uh, in the ATS context, uh, there's a very interesting uh, language change. There was a time when all your quote-unquote sites of education outside of uh, Deerfield was called extension sites, right? And, you know, uh, Dr. Nadinov is here. He is the extension, uh, he, he runs the, that, that program. Um, well, uh, in the 2020 standards, it's no longer extension sites. It's educational or ad additional locations. Um, so I mentioned that as a way of, that there is a, a change uh, that is going on that uh, education with regard to formal and non-formal is tied to questions of space and time and place, but also in different kinds of forms. And that's all being, quote unquote, uh, I think broken down. Uh, I agree with uh, T. to says that, you know, the language needs to, we need to be re more reflective. But it's happening out there, right? Um, so. Competency for, uh, yes. Okay, I think we have time for one more comment question. Amanda. Thank you so much, Dr. Ruiz, uh, Dr. Moore, welcome home. And 
Uh, Reverend Davis, thank you so much for your comments. Um, I really appreciated your helping us think about global awareness beyond just the geographical, thinking about the cultural, uh, gender, and all these other pieces. And um, Dr. Moore, you, you, asked, you, 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 you asked us to think about, as an institution, who are our friends, what do we teach, and what is our mission? How do institutions cultivate friendship with other institutions? I ask this because a lot of those relationships have power dynamics and money as a, just bluntly speaking, uh, the financial element as, as part of the equation. So how do we create relationships um, outside of those uh, two entities? How do we become friends with other institutions? I think that would then help us become better uh, partners and aware of the, the needs there. But how do we become friends? That's my question. I think Dr. Davis mentioned something uh, that is, is a starting point, and that is curiosity and uh, humility. And, um, you know, I think part of, it, part of it goes back to mutuality and reciprocity as well. And you're, you're exactly right. Power plays into this. And, and we have to be aware of that. And sometimes, sometimes, most of the time, we just are not, are we? So I think that's, a, that's one of the huge challenges that, that needs to be present. But we, we were talking, this group, I joined them for a little bit, and they, were, they have the answers to your questions, so you can talk to them afterwards. So, but, but one thing they mentioned is, is what about having a scholar from, um, we were talking about Jake Reed, who I'm actually doing a little thing with tomorrow, and Jake is in Georgia, the country of Georgia. And, you know, He's involved in teaching in a secular university there. And, you know, it's one thing to send someone there, but have someone come here as well. So, I mean, I think reciprocity is critically important and mutuality and recognizing that power dynamic and, and intentionally trying to uh, address that with humility and curiosity. And Dr. Davis, I'm sure, has a better response than that. Where did he go? There you go. Uh, the, the only thing I would add to that is something, let me just speak as a pastor, is we think um, in terms of our international partnerships as a church, we've really been challenged by uh, our denomination, and we are part of the EFCA, never lead with money, and to really engage from the posture that there are going to be resources flowing in both directions, and what does that look like? So. I made reference to a partnership we've now had for about 10 years with a seminary in Port-au-Prince. And so that's been mutual in terms of them coming to us, us coming to them. And um, now we're actually partnering together to send Haitian students as missionaries to Senegal. So, um, but it, I, I think, how do we start with relationships where we can actually have heart-to-heart -heart conversations? And even here, I, I would tell you, just in the context of that experience, some of the most powerful and moving conversations have been uh, having some of my Haitian colleagues say, here, here are messages I think the American church needs to hear, and here, here's what you can learn from us. Like, you don't know how to pray. You don't know how to engage adversity. And there's just some really, I, I would say, moving and powerful conversations. So... I, at least in my experience, that's been part of how do we get beyond that asymmetrical piece that is just warmed over patronage, so. All right, well, uh, thank you all, but particularly my colleague Dana Harris for shepherding this process. We are at almost to the end here and um, I want to do a couple of things. One, uh, there is this brochure, it was at the table uh, when we, you came in. We want you to be ambassadors for the Hebrew Center. Take this with you, um, give it to somebody, uh, make, make us known out there, that's one. Uh, on a shamed um, advertising for the Hebrew Center. Um, so two, um, I want um, the three presenters to uh, uh, come here, uh, please. Um, and it's, I'm not going to do anything bad to you. Um, so just uh, come one by one. 
And uh, I want you to remember that you were here for a Hebert Center event. There is this, there is a pen, and then there is a cup. Uh, so, Dr. Ruiz, uh, so this is yours. Okay, so, okay. And uh, Dr. Moore, this is yours. And uh, Reverend Davis, uh, this is yours. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, uh, this is all good, and now we are ready for um, our dean, uh, uh, David Powell, to come and um, close this time with prayer. But before he prays, this food we purchased. We want you to eat it. <laughs> and uh, so help us. Uh, uh, especially if you are a student, remember the free food factor always works. <laughs> so avail yourself of this. Dr. Powell. Uh, shall we stand? Lord, we give thanks to you for the space you have provided us for this fruitful conversation. A conversation that is not only timely and necessary, but one that is at the very center of the gospel of your Son, the one whom you confess to be the Lord of all. Today we are again reminded of the mission of our university to educate men and women to engage in God's redemptive work in the world. In the post-COVID world, when pressure of survival in the various senses of the world tends to constrain us, may God grant us the strength to take up the responsibility to be globally engaged and responsible as we testify to the power of your gospel throughout the world. Allow us to not simply serve as instruments of information dissemination, but encourage us also to learn from our global partners as we subject ourselves to the powerful gospel that challenges any false claim of superiority and authority. Lord, may this be an act of worship since our hope is in you and you alone. Bless the work of our brother, Lester, and the Global Awareness and Engagement Initiative in promoting global awareness and engagement in the cultural competencies in theological institutions, including our own, that seek to be faithful to the gospel that challenges our biases and assumptions. Bless also the work of the Hebrew Center as we seek to recognize the power of the gospel that transcends all cultural ethnic and geographic boundaries. Above all, remind us to be faithful to you in all that we do and to set our eyes on Jesus our Lord and our Redeemer, in whose name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. There, there is a, the text of the lecture is printed courtesy of the Hebert Center, so you can take uh, the text um, if you like. No. You, we encourage you to take the text with you, especially if you are a student. Uh, so it's going to be at this table. Okay. So please, thank you. This part is done. The food is there.